was just another cold winter day in Portland, Oregon. On the fringe of the city's Sullivan's Gulch, it was still decades before the Interstate 84 would come through or TriMet's Max lines would ultimately come through there. Aside from a single train line running through the gulch and the periodic smattering of drunken transients, not a lot happened down in this area. But that all changed on one February day with one simple grisly discovery that would spawn one of the craziest unsolved murder cases in the history of the city. In the vicinity of Sullivan's Gulch, beneath the Grand Avenue Viaduct, a railroad employee named Louis DeSanos discovered two packages near the railroad tracks. Intrigued, he opened the packages and discovered that they contained two severed legs. A brutal murder had been discovered in Portland. Altogether, the packages reportedly contained the hips of a male along with the right thigh and the calves of both legs. The packaging wrapped around the leg parts were recent newspapers tied off with string. One package was made up of a January 21st, 1920 Oregonian, and the other wrapped in a February 1st, 1920 edition of that same paper. Remarkably, and potentially damaging to the inevitable investigation, DeSanos was obviously shocked by the discovery he made, but he did not report it until hours later when his shift was finished because he didn't feel the discovery was that big of a deal. While the victim had likely been dead a while, it's still astonishing that this railroad employee would not report a discovery of this kind immediately to law enforcement. Upon finally being reported, the case blew up in the city. Clearly, this discovery was the result of a murder of some sort. But dismemberment killings of this type were practically unheard of at this time. Not just in Portland, but all across America. Even by the iconic Cleveland Torso murders of the late 1930s, that was considered a one-of-a-kind happening at the time. And the local authorities were in a very difficult position with this case as, with only the pieces of a man's legs to look over, they were hardly in a position to identify this victim, much less his killer, or killers. An in-depth search of the area in the gulch turned up nothing else. Beyond the legs themselves, and the newspaper wrappings, the only other evidence they had to go on were small sandy gravel particles found on the body parts that led police to believe the body of the victim had, at one time, been laid on someone's concrete floor, likely a basement floor. They would later alter this theory in noting the lack of blood still in these body parts they found. It was ultimately felt that the victim had had his body parts placed in a box filled with sawdust to let the parts bleed out. Thus, these particles ended up on the body parts afterwards. Two street sweepers came forward claiming that, before the remains had been found, that in the early morning hours, presumably of February 7th, they had seen a car stopped on the Grand Avenue viaduct, directly above where the remains were found. This car was sitting there with its lights off, and it had no license plates. With authorities believing the victim had died at least a couple days before these legs were discovered, they quickly dismissed this eyewitness account as having anything to do with the murder. It had been initially felt that the remains found had been thrown from this viaduct, but with where they ultimately fell and the lack of any damage to the sensitive newspaper wrappings, the theory shifted more to the idea that someone had actually walked down to the railroad tracks to deposit these packages. While this case seemed destined to linger unsolved without further evidence, a potential victim actually came quickly to the attention of local police. This man was named Ernest de Comp, a local former saloon owner, originally from France, who had retired to a rural home near Beaverton, just west of Portland. 
Decomp had reportedly last been seen on February 5th, two days before these remains were found, by a George Flechel. Flechel was a business associate of Decomp, and thus would recognize him clearly had he seen him. They encountered one another at approximately 10.30 a.m. on the 5th at the Yam Hill Street Market. Decomp had food and provisions on him, and said that he was on his way to the Franklin Hotel, which still stands at the southwest corner of 13th and Washington Street. He also stated he was planning on visiting a Miss Gardner, who lived on 10th Avenue. However, he never made it to either of these locations. Thus, by the time of the discovery of these remains, Decomp had been missing for about two days. However, as with so many mysterious cases, as quickly as Decomp was becoming the likely victim, accounts suddenly came out of the woodwork from various people. Most notable was that of a locksmith named Sam Goldenberg, who was an acquaintance of Decomp and reported seeing him in front of a clothing store at Fifth and Morrison at approximately 9.30 a.m. on the morning of February 7th, right around the time the remains were being found in Sullivan's Gulch. Goldenberg said he even saw Decomp had a new hat on and paused to look at his reflection as he wore it in the store's window. The police were quick to dismiss this account as it seems they had their victim and didn't want to face the drama of going back to the drawing board. To their credit, however, when employees at this particular clothing store Decomp had reportedly visited were spoken to on the matter, none of them recalled seeing Decomp in there so it's hard to validate or dismiss this account. But Goldenberg was not the only individual who claimed to see Decomp after he supposedly disappeared. A Mrs. Harry McLeod would contact authorities days after the legs were found and report that she saw Decomp in a small car traveling just south of Aloha, a community west of Portland. She said that she had actually spoken to Decomp at this time, and that this encounter occurred on February 11th. She had no idea who the two men were that were traveling with Decomp. It seems this story was given even less credence than that of Sam Goldenberg. The focus was still set on Ernest Decomp as the victim. Kenton, now just another Portland neighborhood, was once its own town, primarily founded as a company town. The area of Kenton is about as far from Sullivan's Gulch as you can get while still being in Portland. It would be right here that two locals, Charles Moxley and Frank Love, stumbled onto two wrapped bundles, as they called them. These bundles were modestly obscured in a thicket area near the intersection of Brandon and McClellan Streets, next to Kenton Park. These bundles just happened to be wrapped in local newspapers from the prior week and wrapped tightly with string. Suspicions arose and the police were contacted. When the bundles were unwrapped, they revealed portions of a man's torso. These parts were also found to have sandy gravel particles on them. And while the cause of death could not be examined by the leg parts alone, the torso was found to have a deep stab wound into its stomach, which authorities theorized might have been the cause of death. It made sense, too, as by this point, it was believed a large knife of some kind had been used to attack and then likely cut the body apart. Just like with the Sullivan's Gulch remains, there was another witness to another car that may have possibly been involved. A Mrs. John Crawford, who lived near where the remains were discovered in Kenton, stated that around 10 p.m. on February 6th, she heard a car speeding along and then stop suddenly. The car remained stopped nearby for several minutes before departing. This would have been the night before the legs were found in Sullivan's Gulch. Based on the point of discovery, whoever deposited the Kenton remains, if they were traveling by car, would have had to get out of their vehicle to deposit them. Hence, this may have been the guilty party heard by Miss Crawford. 
just as well, it may have been a random person visiting a neighbor or dropping someone off. Another car, another dismissal of its importance. However, it seemed unlikely that the remains had been left there days before, as they were described as appearing freshly cut when they were found. One witness even described them as looking like meat to be hung in a butcher's shop. Upon further examination of these torso parts, the texture, age, color, and state of the skin matched well with that of the legs found in Sullivan's Gulch. Also, based on matching the torso parts with the hips, they matched together, leading authorities to believe the parts found in Kenton and Sullivan's Gulch were from the same man. While the newspapers and the public took this as definitive, even Lieutenant Inspector Jack Galtz, who was significant in investigating this case, would say in the aftermath of the torso discovery that it was impossible to say for certain that these parts were from the same person. But at the same time, we had a murder type that practically never happened, with remains discovered wrapped in the same way and both with gravel particles on them. By all logic, these pieces were, at least, deposited by the same killer. And obviously, that killer had fashioned a plan to cut up his or her victims and spread them all around the city, likely to make them more difficult to discover. Whether the newspapers that the parts were wrapped up in had any particular significance overall was never established. An initial theory actually pushed in the time shortly after the legs were first found was that the crime was actually a prank done by local medical students. This theory incensed local Portlanders and was, at least in part, dismissed rather quickly. The potential prank hoax angle, however, would briefly be revived when Ernest A. Comp came into consideration as a possible victim. For a short time, it was pondered that he had in fact, disappeared, but had done so because he wanted to disappear and thus was behind the depositing of these legs that were found. How he would have obtained real human legs is an obvious question without an answer, but for a brief period it was considered that Decomp was not the victim, but rather behind the whole situation. A couple days after the Kenton discovery, the idea that Decomp left town as opposed to being murdered was bolstered by a French woman named Carmen Dreyfus. Her friend, Margaret Jobert, who was living in Scapoose, had reportedly disappeared too. The fact that Jobert could not be contacted for several days at this point suggests she disappeared fairly closely to when Decomp disappeared. But why would these two disappearances be related? Well, back in 1916, Jaubert had filed suit against Ernest A. Comp over a breach of promise. Thus, these two had a past history with one another. When Jaubert could not be reached after De Comp disappeared, police began dabbling with the idea that the two had, quote, mended their ways and for some reason left town together. This wouldn't explain the body parts being found around the city, and there was nothing to actually verify this. And as far as what actually happened to Margaret Jobert, as far as I could find, I have no idea. Her name quickly faded away in relation to this story. Regardless of other possibilities, it was deemed to be obvious at this point that someone had butchered one man and was spreading their parts all over the city. Abruptly, authorities began searching any gulch slough, or forested area. With panic in the city growing day by day, there was one main objective, finding the victim's head. Authorities were playing with the idea that the head may have been deposited in the Columbia Slough, just to the north end of Kenton, and they dragged the slough in their search efforts. No luck. But another source, who doubted De Comp was the murder victim, was the very man who also wouldn't just play along with the presumption that these body parts all belonged to the same person. That was Inspector Jack Goltz. Goltz knew Ernest de Comp personally and expressed that de Comp had thick, dark hair, thick, dark head hair, thick, dark arm hair. 
He reported that the body parts found, primarily the legs, had barely any hair on them at all, and the hair that had been found on the body was light in color. This alone would serve to vindicate Decomp was not the murder victim. However, aside from Goltz's claim here, I found no further verification as to the victim's hair type and color. It had been nearly a month since this grisly murder case began, and the trail had gone cold. Ernest de Comp is still at the top of the victims list, but it still wasn't verified. A boy living in Selwood was wandering in the vicinity of the Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge when he discovered a human hand and foot. Immediately, police were alerted, and the police had their next pieces of evidence. Almost. Shortly after this discovery, the head of a man was also found in Selwood, only a couple blocks from Oaks Bottom. The head of the victim was found to not be that of Ernest A. Comp, and it was quickly deemed that the hand and foot found at the bottom belonged to this mysterious Selwood victim. It was never connected with this torso case, and yet These were body parts of the torso victim that had not been found. Why it was never considered that this victim, whose remains were found in Selwood, could not have possibly been the same one as those whose remains were being found in Sullivan's Gulch and Kenton? I really don't know. But this may have been body parts of that victim, even if they didn't belong to Ernest A. Comp. Interestingly enough, though, within hours of these discoveries in Selwood, on the same day, two sisters, Virginia and Beatrice Winchell, were playing near their home in the vicinity of Northeast 81st Avenue and Failing Street. Near them was a hole dug in the ground, described as a can dump. As the name might imply, it was a big hole dug for people to dispose their old cans in. But as these two girls passed over the hole, they noticed something other than cans. Two partially opened packages. The girls quickly ran to their father, George, to tell him of their discovery. When the packages were unearthed, one revealed the right arm of a man, complete with dark arm hair, just like Decomp had. The other package revealed the left thigh of a man, The right thigh of the victim had been found in Sullivan's Gulch earlier. Like the others, these two packages had been wrapped with string and recent local newspapers, specifically the February 3rd, 1920 Morning Oregonian, in this case. These remains were quickly also deemed to belong to Portland's mystery torso murder victim. The discovery of this dark arm hair was very persuasive, even to those who claimed a comp was still likely alive, that he was, in fact, this victim. Alas, these would be the last verified remains recovered of this murder victim. The left arm, the hands, the feet, and most importantly, the head, would never be recovered. Or would it? <laughs> On March 18th, 1920... More than a month after the first discovery, a man staying at the old Davis block in Albina, in between Sullivan's Gulch and Kenton, contacted the police, frantic, reporting he had just discovered a human skull under his bed. Everyone, even the border, felt that Ernest de Comp's head had been recovered. But it turned out to be a simple misunderstanding. A prior border, a Miss E.B. Wilson, was a collector of various relics, including skulls, apparently. She'd accidentally left this one behind when she left. Obviously, the skull belonged to someone gone much longer than the torso victim. Interestingly enough, a human leg would later be found in the small port town of Ketchikan on the southern edge of Alaska that oddly was discovered when a former Portland police officer, J.S. Smith, relocated there, of all places. 
It obviously didn't belong to the victim, but, if anything, it sought to keep interest in the case alive. But weeks turned to months, and soon a year passed, with no more updates or new discoveries. Perhaps the most intriguing thing to come up during this time was the reports, amidst the belief that Decomp had died and thus had finances and an estate to assess, that an adopted son of his had been discovered living in South Africa. By all the reports in the papers, this son was the heir to all of Decamp's goods. A while later, a Miss Jean Gravois would come forward, claiming she had married Decamp albeit in a wedding that proved fraudulent, several years earlier. She filed suit, claiming to be the sole heir to his estate, but by 1922, her efforts would prove fruitless. I never was able to find out exactly whose hands de Comp's estate ultimately fell into. The disbursement of the body parts fell in an interesting triangular fashion, with distances from Sullivan's Gulch, to the other two depositing sites being almost the same exact distance apart. Perhaps there was a reason for this, but more than likely it was just the killer trying to spread the pieces as far apart as possible. Even with the questions, I am personally convinced, not beyond any possible doubt, but still convinced that the murder victim was, in fact, Ernest A. Comp. It seemed the more parts found, the more it suggested him to be the man. Otherwise, what happened to him if he wasn't killed? Despite a few accounts, with nothing to back them, after February 5, 1920, Ernest A. Comp was never seen again. Not in Portland, not anywhere. So at this point, this piece will continue, with the focus being specifically on De Comp, and trying to figure out the what and the why of how he died. That said, by 1922, the case had all but faded from public interest, with even the local police barely investigating it anymore, just assuming it was Ernest A. Comp, and thus everyone could move on with their lives. But there's an important question that needs to be addressed here, that had been intentionally saved for this time to ask. That question is, why Ernest A. Comp? Of all people, why would someone not only murder this specific man, but also butcher him in such a violent way? Not a lot is known of Ernest de Comp before the dawn of the 1900s. I found evidence of him purchasing property in Portland as far back as 1890. By 1901, he had found entry level employment at a saloon located at Northeast 2nd and Davis Street. Now, in the midst of Portland's Chinatown, back in the day, this was Portland's notorious North End, an area lined with sketchy saloons and shady rooming houses. Just about anyone living or working in this area was doing something crooked on the side. It was into this world that Frenchman de Comp gained prominence. He may have just been another guy on the street at first, but by the time of his disappearance in 1920, his circumstances would be quite different. Inspector Goltz, in his theorization regarding why he felt Decomp may have just left Portland, stemmed from looking back at his past in a city in which he admitted he'd discovered disgraceful and impure things about Decomp's character, and potentially he fled knowing some of these details would ultimately come out. He even theorized that Decomp may have become mentally unhinged by all this and simply, in a broken state, wandered out of the city. Perhaps even some other city, somewhere out there, would soon report that they discovered a bewildered man showing up out of nowhere, and it would just end up being a perplexed Ernest Decomp. This, of course, would never end up happening. So who was Ernest Decomp during this time? Within two years, he'd managed to gain the clout to buy into the saloon he worked at and became partners with a reportedly shady local Italian man named Caesar Marco. They changed the saloon's name to Decomp and Marco, which functioned almost like a combo saloon and liquor store. While they would later relocate their saloon to the northeast corner of 3rd and Cooch Street, a block away, 
In these early days at 2nd and Davis, their place was at the same intersection as the Senate Saloon, owned by the infamous North Ender, Elizabeth Smith, or Elizabeth Young, or Elizabeth Hutchinson, or... She had a lot of names. But more than any other, she was known in the area as Liverpool Liz. Numerous articles and written pieces have been done about Liverpool Liz, who, in a time when women couldn't even be bartenders, she ran her own saloon. While fancying herself as a respectful saloon owner at this time, with a criminal record, there was a lot of crookedness going on in her establishment. In 1903, a Joseph Gilmore claimed he was drugged and robbed at the Senate, a story that caught some local attention. Perhaps the craziest story to come out of the Senate saloon would be the burning death of a woman named Nora Stone. Stone, a local prostitute, came to the Senate one night with a woman with a history of mental illness named Blanche Tompkins. The women had been arguing all night and at one point were in a room on the second floor above the saloon wherein Tompkins either threw or accidentally dropped an oil lamp on stone, setting her on fire. She'd later die of these injuries. And while Liverpool Liz was connected with a great deal of influential figures in the North End area, one of whom is consistently ignored is Ernest de Comp. One could argue that de Comp and Liverpool Liz's relationship went as far back as 1901 and they absolutely had to be close with one another. Why? Well, after the business dropped, Liz eventually closed down the Senate Saloon around 1909. She would later die of pneumonia in 1913 at the age of 60. And here's where things get interesting. When she first died, there was no known will. But about a week after her death, a will was suddenly seemingly found and presented, showing it had been executed on July 19th, 1909. Despite the suspect origin of this will, a Frenchman named C. Henry Laub, who knew Ernest de Comp directly, presented it in court to validate its authenticity. The will was ultimately authenticated, and who were the witnesses documented on this suspicious will? Caesar Marco and Ernest de Comp. So de Comp was close enough with Liverpool Liz that she asked him to be a witness on her will. Granted, the suspicions that this will was faked never went away. And if it was faked, it shows de Comp's collusion in that fakery. But we just don't know for certain. And whatever was happening at Liz's Senate Saloon back in the day, there was likely much of the same going on at de Comp's place. Vice, crooked financial practices, prostitution. Definitely prostitution. De Comp liked the women. He had so many contacts from local ladies that after his disappearance, women's phone numbers were found scrawled on his walls. I even managed to stumble onto this little gem of an article from October 1907, showing de Comp getting mixed up in legal proceedings regarding several women of reportedly ill repute. But beyond the women and all the questionable saloon business, de Comp over time began functioning in an almost banker bondsman type capacity, providing help for fellow local Frenchmen many of whom were likely underworld characters. However, in doing this, de Comp also put himself in a place of power over many people whose crooked pasts he knew of, allowing him to turn on any of these people if he pleased. An anonymous French Portlander told reporters in 1922 that in his time, de Comp had made more enemies than friends with how he lorded over people and kept them under his thumb. While in 1920, much of de Comp's suspect background seemed to be kept under wraps, leading many people to be perplexed as to why he would be killed, a deeper understanding as to his pre-1920s activities shows that there were a good many men out there who'd have had a motive to cause him harm. There was even a brief theory that de Comp was killed after getting mixed up with bootleggers, 
with whom the relationship had gone south, and they ended up killing him. Then came Prohibition. While it did not completely take effect until 1920, Prohibition started in Portland around 1916. This immediately killed Decomp's saloon business, and while it seems he smuggled a good deal of booze out as his house was found to have a massive collection of alcohol, he most likely delved deeper into his bondsman-type venture. This would keep him afloat, along with any other crooked vice he may have been involved in. By the time of his disappearance, he was worth about $75,000 in investments, and that didn't include whatever actual cash he may have had on hand. He was doing very well for himself, and was even retired by the time of his disappearance. But this was not the end. Some papers referred to him as a prominent French underworld figure. Another paper referred to him as a little king of Portland's French underworld. With the influence he held over so many, it seemed at this time de Comp was almost comparable to a high up organized crime figure who'd maybe gone too far. He was not just the passive former saloon owner who liked to buy new hats and follow the investment market before calmly returning to his rural home at the end of the day. This guy had enemies. But who would ultimately murder him again in such a brutal fashion? And why? Certainly the method used screamed of a potential underworld slaying, but it could just as well have been a lunatic with a graphically murderous mind. But two things, I feel, need to be acknowledged here to potentially understand why this may have happened. Namely, Ernest de Comp was a French immigrant, and he was connected with the French underworld. Now there's a saying known in the Paris underworld that states, I will feed my enemy to the dogs. This specifically referred to the killing and dismembering of one's enemy cutting them up, and feeding them to the dogs, so to speak. Disturbing, yes. Factual, yes. Back in this time, it wasn't rare for body parts of random people to suddenly show up in Paris suburbs. It was a known underworld method. So, especially being French, it made sense that Descamps might just find such an ending for himself. But perhaps Equally as important among those in the French underworld was the notion of not talking. This meant anything you were mixed up in, you did not tell the authorities, and you did not rat on anyone. And as far as research went, Ernest de Comte never did talk or rat out anyone, except for one man. Such is how the case would be revived in the spring of 1922. While local police had lost interest, a new lead would be pushed by, of all people, a member of Portland's U.S. Immigration Office. This man, R.P. Bonham, had run across another Frenchman named Louis Victor Breyer and his wife, a once Mrs. Alfred Desjardins. These two had a habit of constantly trying to sneak into America even though they did not have legal status there. But in his dealings with Breyer, and coming from Portland, Bonham learned that Breyer and DeCamp had actually been longtime friends. In fact, according to one paper, he secured Breyer work at, of all places, Liverpool Liz's Senate Saloon. A correlation between Breyer and Liverpool Liz makes sense as, reportedly, Breyer's wife's nickname was Liverpool Lizzie. Just a coincidental pet name, I'm sure. These two men were reportedly always cordial with one another, until the summer of 1918. At this time, a serious conflict began between the two, splintering their friendship and reportedly starting over financial issues. And while de Comp seemed to have control over a good many individuals in Portland, he also knew at the time that both Breyer and his wife were in the country illegally. He thus sought his revenge by reporting them to immigration to have them deported from the country. And what would become a reoccurring thing for the Breyers, they somehow learned of this threat and fled Portland before they could be captured. 
they would ultimately be tracked down in Montana and then deported. And almost immediately, Breyer swore revenge against Decomp because he'd broken the rules. He ratted out a fellow Frenchman. So Louis Breyer had a motive to go after Ernest Decomp, and it was an underworld-style wronging that suggests that motive. Thus, in the case of Breyer, Decomp had set himself up to be, quote, fed to the dogs. The problem was that Breyer was deported in 1918, and by 1922, when he came under scrutiny for this murder, he was also out of the country. However, after deportation in 1918, Breyer and his wife immediately made plans to get back into America. Based on their statements to Parisian authorities, it suggested that the couple was traveling from Mexico up to Vancouver, BC in Canada, and just happened to be around the Portland area during February 1920. Breyer would later alter his account, stating that he'd been in Vancouver, BC through 1920 into 1921. It was obvious both he and his wife had something to cover. When asked about when she first learned of Decomp's death, Mrs. Breyer said that it was after they fled Portland to avoid deportation. But again, that was back in 1918, almost two years before the death occurred. Breyer himself then said he first heard about it in Paris in October 1921, a time in which he was supposed to have been in Mexico. Conveniently, they both lied about how they learned of Decomp's death. By March 1922, Breyer and his wife were known to be on their way to Canada from France, and authorities were prepared to take them into custody on the Decomp case. But once again, somehow, Breyer escaped. He, by chance, encountered an officer who knew of his pending arrest and bribed him to the amount of $10, about $153 today, to keep quiet and they quickly fled by ship back to France. But only weeks later, at the beginning of summer, the couple returned and were apprehended in Vancouver, BC. Word came down to Bonham, and the Portland police and quickly Deputy Sheriff H. Christofferson traveled north to question Breyer, who, again, was in a country illegally. But upon his arrival, Christofferson learned that, for whatever reason, Breyer had been released. As a matter of fact, he'd been released before authorities there even got the report that he'd been there illegally. Once released, the Breyers fled so quickly that they left their luggage behind, and back to France they went. There were no reports beyond these in 1922 that I was able to find that suggest that the Breyers were ever apprehended in North America again or ever questioned by local authorities about the death of Ernest A. Comp. But he had been in the Portland area. He had the motive, and conveniently enough, Louis Breyer was a butcher by trade. Thus, he likely had the skills, the tools, and the means to take care of Ernest A. Comp in the way he was taken care of. The fact that Decomp was last seen several blocks from his next planned destination on February 5th, 1920, it leaves one to wonder if Breyer was watching him and perchance instigated an encounter, likely under a quote, let's bury the hatchet type scenario. And in these efforts, he managed to lure Decomp away somewhere private where he was able to attack. Again, the torso was found to have a deep penetrating wound in the stomach that may have been the fatal wound. However it happened, Breyer would have procured some location where he used his butchering skills to dismember and spread the body parts all over Portland. He likely then split with his wife, who may or may not have been involved as well, north to Canada. And if this is, in fact, what happened, the overall plot had to be meticulously planned out. And if it was Louis Breyer's work, then he had over a year to plan it out. It's not just that he pulled off the murder without being seen, or that he spread the remains all over strategically, but it appears the dismemberment was so structured 
that it appeared the specific body parts of Decomp that were never recovered were never recovered for a reason. Obviously, his head was never found. But while his right arm was found, his left arm never was. And his left arm just happened to have a distinct tattoo of a snake that he would periodically roll his sleeve up and show people. His killer would know finding this tattoo on a body part would definitively prove Decomp to be the victim. By doing this, it always kept the idea of Decomp as the victim one degree away from being fully verified. Thus, even if he, the killer, were apprehended as a suspect, he would be apprehended for the killing of Ernest Decomp, of whom, in court, they wouldn't even be able to prove was actually dead. This was well planned, and as it stands today, Louis Victor Breyer is the most likely suspect in the case of the murder against Ernest A. Comp, but in never being questioned by local authorities and never having been charged, we only have circumstantial evidence to rely on. But this is not quite the end of the story. Fast forward to 1935, 15 years after the murder, Jack DeWitt, was a freelance writer at the time who later became a screenwriter for dozens of movies including, interestingly enough, the 1957 film Portland Expose, a film about crime and vice in Portland. But in 1935, DeWitt would report that he met a Frenchman named Edouard Henry Lapin in 1930. Lapin was imprisoned at Devil's Island in French Guiana, awaiting his execution for the killing of a convict he'd been imprisoned with. When they met, Lapine reportedly told DeWitt that he had killed and dismembered the body of a man in an American city several years earlier. This immediately led to local newspapers declaring that the murder of Ernest A. Comp was officially solved. However, Lapine's story was vague to say the least, not even specifying when or where it had occurred. The papers also reported that Lapine had been near Portland around the time of Decomp's disappearance before being tracked to Vancouver, BC. Sound familiar? Well, according to one source I saw, it was expressed that Louis Breyer would ultimately be executed on Devil's Island in 1930, same time and place as Eduardo Henry Lapine. You probably see where this is going. The implication has been made that Breyer and Lapine were one and the same. This is very interesting as Louis Breyer had aliases, but I never found Lapine's name as one of them. However, in an interesting twist, Breyer's known nickname was The Rabbit. The Rabbit, translated into French, is Le Lapine. Eduardo Henry. Lapine. All of these things suggest that the two men were one and the same. However, as we know Breyer was married and reportedly killed Decomp out of revenge, DeWitt would state that Lapine said the murder occurred over a woman. This doesn't seem to tie into the Decomp murder in any way. What woman? Breyer's wife? There's nothing to suggest a relationship between her and Decomp. It's also stated that Lapine fled America via jumping bail, meaning he was being held for some crime. There's no reports that while in Canada in 1920 and 1921 that Breyer was held for a crime or that he jumped bail before returning to France. And if it was Breyer, who spent a lot of time in Portland and had supposedly known Decomp for a long time and plotted his murder for quite a while and was about to be executed, meaning he had nothing to hide, then why was he so passive and vague about describing this killing? It didn't even seem that DeWitt was aware that Breyer, or Lapine, was a person of interest in the Decomp murder. And yet, this is all we are left with. This 1930 account is the last piece of potential evidence in the case of the man who was murdered and hacked to pieces in Portland in 1920. In the prevailing 90 years since that last account, as far as I can tell, there have been no new pieces of evidence, no new possible suspects, and, to be honest, 
It seems before we even reached the 1930s that the local law enforcement had lost any interest in solving this case. And the public, as is often the case, simply forgot it over time. I mean, the 1920s gave us plenty of things to distract us. And yet it's maddening to think that, in the end, all this case gives us is an endless succession of maybes and what-ifs. At the same time, for all of the extra frustration it induces, Jack DeWitt's story really is the perfect example of why this murder case is so incredible and so strange. It only adds to the mystery. It only adds to the questions. It only provides further circumstantial evidence in a case that, 100 years later, has only that. We know Ernest Acomp vanished in 1920. We know someone was brutally murdered, dismembered, and discarded all over the city of Portland. In the end, that is all we actually know for certain about this case. And yet this case is so long forgotten. Even in reflecting back, even in local crime sleuth circles, this case is practically never brought up, which is astonishing as it is potentially the most incredible unsolved murder in the history of the city of Portland. <laughs>